We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And to join me in the G spot, that is guest spotlight, do not be scared, I have the wonderful, the amazing Dr. Corey Emanuel in the flesh. The crowd goes wild. He is a media psychologist and writer and producer. You guys may be familiar with him on a previous episode I did uh, with him during uh, COVID, right? Like yeah. when we were quarantining and yeah, I was doing yeah. a lot of Zooms at the time. Mm -hmm. So blessed and fortunate to have you now, like in person physically. Yeah. We, we don't have to stay detached anymore. No, absolutely not. Uh, yeah. But I'm super grateful that you were able to make today happen. Glad to be here. You are going to start with me. Um, so this episode, we're going to talk about attachment style. Yep. Uh, but you are going to start with sharing my spice breaker, which is... When did you first fall in love with yourself? Give me the I moment that story. I first fell in love with myself, I would say maybe about three or four years ago, actually. Wow. Yeah, happened? like I feel like it happened like right before the pandemic, which was a beautiful time mm. to transition into a lot of isolation, actually. Yeah. Because I was able to really foster my self-love in a way that I had never been able mm. to. Right. Because I hadn't fallen in love with myself. Yeah. Right. Which I don't think you have to fall in love with yourself to foster self-love. But there definitely becomes this moment where you're like, oh, should I really love myself? Mm -hmm. I want to spend more time with myself. I want to pour into myself yeah. more when you fall in love with yourself. So, yeah. What was the difference? So how did you know you weren't necessarily in love with yourself? By the way I talked to myself, mm. by the way I treated myself, by the way I treated other people, mm. even relationships that I was in. I felt like some of my relationships and friendships were a reflection of how I wasn't really taking care mm. of myself. Yeah. So I, it was sort of my relationships were becoming mirrors for me in yeah. a way that showed, well, you don't really love yourself as much as you should. What specifically happened that was your come to Jesus moment that you were like, OK, I need to do better to self. Usually there's uh, something within career or relationship yeah. that you're like, oh, you hurt me in a way that I'm not going to let yeah, this happen to it me was, again. It was a dating relationship <laughs> that had been <laughs> like really the core of my Los Angeles identity. So mm. I've been in L L.A. now for nine years. Yeah. And for six and a half of those, like maybe seven and a half, eight at that time, mm. I had been in a relationship that wasn't healthy. Mm. That was actually very dysfunctional. I know we're going to get into attachment yeah, style, yeah. but it was very much a me being anxious and avoidant, which mm. were my two buckets, dating someone who was fearful and avoided. Mm. So it was just a lot. And then once I was able to heal, going to therapy, doing the work yeah. in that relationship towards the end of it, when I was able to say, okay, I'm, I'm done with this now. Yeah. Like I, I, I know I deserve better. I'm worthy of better. That's when I was able to move more into, oh, I'm, I'm falling in love with me now because yeah. I, I needed to detach from the toxicity mm. in order to really fall in love with myself. Isn't it interesting, though, to see yourself go through this in, because uh, I know I experienced this too, right? Where we're, we may be educated in this industry. We've, we've had certain life experiences. We've counseled several amount of people. And then you see yourself go through it and you're like, how did I let that happen? I know better. How did I let that happen? Absolutely. How did you let it happen? <sighs> It's it's the attachment stuff. Like I love that <laughs> the question comes full circle to this because you know I grew up in a very dysfunctional, uh, toxic mm. environment growing up. My dad, unfortunately, at the time was a drug addict mm. and alcoholic, and my mom was just trying to keep the family together. Yeah, and so I took on a lot of those sort of healer fixer. Mm tendencies yeah. and I brought those into my adult relationships. I was kind of more attracted to, mm -hmm. I think unconsciously, somebody that maybe needed a little pick me up. They needed a little bit more love and nurturing and I just got stuck in that cycle for way too long. Yeah. Yeah. And then you were like, okay, enough is enough. Enough is enough. <laughs> yeah, and I think also not to call my mom out, um, but my mom, uh, I've since lost my stepdad. Um, he Sorry. died from COVID, unfortunately. Um, but I was still witnessing her in a second toxic relationship. Mm. And so I was I was like, oh, no, I, I mm. can't do or be in anything long term like I've witnessed my mom do twice now. Yeah. I need somebody has to break the cycle. Yeah. And so that. That was also part of my growth and healing. Dang, that's interesting you say yeah. that. That's actually, my mom fueled 
my purpose, my passion in life, and me even going through the journey of what I feel like was uh, anxious to avoid it back to <laughs> anxious to secure. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have gone through an evolution uh, of styles, which we're going to get into like the role that even, you know, family plays on that. Right. Uh, and you're going to speak to that. But I appreciate you uh, agreeing to vulnerability, right? And yeah. like, not just how you um, manage your clients, but also your personal experiences. Because yeah. I think that that's what makes us human is like us sharing that so that people know we're not just coming from uh, maybe a clinical place, but also like Real I'm a freaking human. I have permission experience. to make mistakes. I don't care what I do for a living. I got permission. Absolutely. So in the spicy life, you, uh, and I've touched on this before, um, like briefly in episodes, the attachment styles, but you had, uh, I feel like my reaching out to you always comes from a post because I love your content. Um, you have found a way on social media to, uh, really communicate, I feel like, in a way around mental health and the importance of it and still having these like very interesting posts that I can't help but to like, I'm going to keep swiping right to like get to the yeah. end. I'm going to just read the entire thing because I'm. I, this is good. This yeah, is good. This is good. Yeah. And you had posted something about uh, what it feels like to date secure attachment style. Yeah. And I think that, and I see this even with my clients, uh, we all come in wanting a secure attachment style right mm -hmm. like this is even when i make clients do their pizza um which is an exercise that i give uh they oftentimes will say well i want a secure person mm -hmm. we ask for that not necessarily knowing one how to get it or how to behave mm -hmm. with a secure attachment style yeah. and so i want you to kind of break down the three different attachment styles yeah. actually four right because yeah. we mentioned that there's four yeah um, and then we will get into uh, the secure attachment and what that looks like and how to become it. Sure. So yeah, let's let's go down the list. Let so go. secure mm -hmm. attachment is the one that we all are ultimately trying to get after, and that when someone is securely attached, they grew up in an environment where you know their parents were available. Mm -hmm. You know, they were emotionally supportive of them, and then they were able to transition through adolescence and adulthood and maintain this sense of I'm good. Yeah. Like I've, I've gotten the love and, and support that I've needed throughout my life. So that is ultimately where we want to be because that's where healthy relationships thrive. Yeah. Right. Then you've got this bucket of insecure attachments. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we break those into different little buckets. So one of them is anxious. Like you talked about, I've definitely dealt with, yeah. you've dealt with and in ancient or anxious, you know, uh, environments as a child, you know, you dealt with probably feeling abandoned, mm -hmm. probably not feeling like your parents really showed up for you mm -hmm. in ways, maybe you even felt rejected in a lot of ways. So again, you carry those yep. wounds into your adult relationships, right? Then you've got avoidant. And I, I have this theory, and there is some research to support that in terms of gender that you find that more women fall in the anxious bucket mm -hmm. and men fall in the avoidant. Totally. But, yeah, but in an avoidant, you dealt with more so like insensitive parents, mm. right? Like, and maybe they were even in inconsistent mm. in terms of being available and showing you. So avoidant people are, are kind of like, uh, let yeah. me pull away. You may even <laughs> find people uh, who ghost, they, they probably fall under that avoidant attachment style, right? And then the last bucket, which doesn't get talked about a lot, we discussed this earlier, yeah. it's sort of known as either disorganized or fearful. Yeah. Um, but those um, are folks who probably dealt with some level of childhood abuse or trauma or adverse experiences growing up. So they kind of go through this cycle of like, they may want to get close to you, yeah. but then they pull back and then... It, it, that cycle kind of repeats itself. So if you're dating someone who's fearful or, or disorganized, it can kind of feel chaotic. The relationship can kind of feel chaotic yeah. to you because they don't really know if they can trust you because of the trauma and the abuse that they've been to. And so that is being projected onto those people that they try to do relationships with. I found it interesting that fearful and disorganized was not mentioned in Attached, what I think uh, is a great book that everybody, uh, if you can get your hands on it, I definitely recommend it. I've recommended this like multiple times. Um, in order to discover your attachment style, you even mentioned like there's an you know online quiz for you to take so you can find out your attachment style. But I found it interesting that the authors didn't mention disorganized or fearful. They right. left it just in the like insecure bucket of like avoidant mm -hmm. and uh, insecure. And so uh, 
I mean, sorry, um, avoiding anxious. Yeah. Why? Why does this one not get talked about? You know, so here's the thing with attachment styles. There is a spectrum. Even secure people probably have a little bit of something else going on. It just doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. Like secure, their secure attachment is certainly dominant. That's mm -hmm. the way they really move through relationships. But I, I think when it comes to the spectrum, to your point, that people who are fearful, and I think there's actually research to support this, also has a little bit of anxious and avoidant wrapped up uh, in them a too. So unhealthy I think, combo sushi. Like. <laughs> yeah, so I just think for the simplicity of it, they just said, all right, let's just call it these three dominant. And if maybe in therapy and counseling, you find that. that there's some, some childhood abuse and trauma that's there, then they'll delve more in, more into the fearful side. But okay, because there is some overlapping within with anxious all, and avoidant yeah, for absolutely. fearful. I feel like aren't all those fearful? So yeah, maybe that is I, I why. I think that's yeah. I think we're we're wrapping our head around. It. And I will say, with me personally, I remember when I first took the attachment style quiz years ago. Um, I was predominantly avoidant, followed by anxious. Mm. Right, and so to your point, yeah. If you take the quiz, and I hope our listeners will, yes. if they haven't done it, or even go back if you haven't taken it in a while, yeah. because when I went back and and took it again, I was now secure, predominantly. Yes. Right, and so I do. You do think the work, you, you get the results. Absolutely. So. Yeah. What does uh, the work look like? So if someone is saying, okay, maybe I'm anxious or avoidant or with somebody who is anxious, avoidant or fearful, mm -hmm. uh, what would be like step number one to, because we all want secure, like I said, yeah. secure is sexy, secure is like, okay, I know who I am and I know what I have to offer and I will make you feel safe in the relationship. Mm -hmm. We all want that, Absolutely. but we may not all one be prepared for that. Sure. And so one thing that I try to help my clients with is like, uh, you have to be in alignment with the thing that you're trying to manifest, with the thing that you're trying to attract. So if you want secure, it will work in your favor to be secure. Absolutely. This is how we're going to get there. Yeah. I want to hear your steps to uh, guiding someone to secure attachment style. Sure. And I want to also point out that when I started dating someone that was securely attached, mm -hmm. I was still in that anxious, mm -hmm. avoidant wheelhouse mm -hmm. right so I, I just want people to know that you may already be in a dynamic like that mm -hmm. where your partner is secure and maybe you're not those relationships can still work but you're gonna if you're not the one that's <laughs> secure you're gonna have to do the work because you could very well push the secure right, partner you could sabotage away the relationship. because they can love you all day long but if you're not doing the work mm -hmm. and they're feeling like we keep having the same yeah. issue over and over again they will withdraw and, and pull away from you. But I would say the first thing anybody would should do, first of all, is take the quiz, know where you stand. But you, you've got to get in touch with your own emotions first. Mm. And there's a, there's a, a research-based uh, framework called the emotional wheel. If mm -hmm. you Google it, it's out there. I love the emotional wheel. But yeah, it talks about it how great. like, yeah, like how we have these just sort of surface emotions that we always go to, yep. right? That I'm either angry, I'm sad, or I'm happy, happy right? Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many more emotions to that. I think the anger one, um, and, I, and I think about my fellas when it comes to this is like, there are layers to why you might be angry. Mm -hmm. It could be something that happened when you were nine years old and you're still harboring mm -hmm that resentment and that anger for. So I think the first thing you've got to do is really get in touch in tune and sit with that emotion. If you're like, okay, I see what it is. I'm actually dealing with a lot of jealousy. Mm. You got to own that. Yeah. You can't just be like, well, I, I, I get jealous and don't do stuff to make me jealous. <laughs> well, no, really unearth. Well, where did the jealousy right. start? Right. And what continues to trigger my jealousy? Is it really my partner that I'm with or is it something that happened two relationships ago that I haven't healed from? Mm. So you got to, that's the first step is really truly outside of your partner who hopefully is doing their work too. Yeah. Getting really, really deep dive into what am I feeling? What keeps coming up for me? Because it's probably so emotional the same awareness. emotional awareness okay. that increasing that emotional intelligence is going to be the first place to start. Then from there, Nobody's really expecting you to do it solo dolo on your own. Mm. It may be a call for therapy. It may be a call for group therapy, right? I'm, I'm right now working on trying to pull together what would be like a men's group counseling group oh, for 2024. Yes. 
because we know as, as dudes, and this is going back to the whole avoidant or dismissive attached style, we grew up with the whole man up, the whole, yep. you know, boys don't cry. Yeah. You know, only girls cry. Are you a sissy? And so we have this conditioning mm-hmm. of just not talking about our emotions. Yeah. But I do think, and I've seen this, I've experienced it. I've been in some group counseling sessions with other men. Once they see their peers do it, Facts. the wall starts to calm down. Yep. Right? So whatever method, if you're just like, mm, I'm not on that therapy, eh, I'm join not trying to do that yeah. one-on-one, do join group. a group, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that there has to be sort of baby steps. There's no like overnight one size fits all. Or if everybody just does this, then you'll move into this level of secure attachments. You yeah. got to kind of go on your individual journey. I think uh, you highlighting the men, right? We're seeing now in, in our generation, um, our parents weren't talking about girl, it didn't work out because he was avoidant. Like, <laughs> mom didn't Never. have those conversations. Right. But I think now as uh, one of the first generations to have permission to be vulnerable, we're starting to go down this uh, mental health journey where we're like, okay, I want a better relationship with self. As a result, I hope to have a healthier relationship with partner. But I feel like us as women have led that movement, not so much men, but us as women. And with us getting more aware, also determining that we also have a need for this to be reciprocated, we're starting to pinpoint the lack of within men that we're dating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're now vocalizing it and saying like, not just that you're uh, anxious or avoidant, but also you were emotionally unavailable to me, right? And in us highlighting with this higher level of awareness, Mm -hmm. we're also pinpointing the male inadequacy and now making them feel also not enough, Mm -hmm. but it still has to be done because we still are trying to pull them over into this. But I I say all this to say, I had a um, client who had gotten into a discussion with um, a gentleman and he was saying like, can you women give us grace? Mm-hmm. We aren't going at the same rate as you. Mm-hmm. And you are asking us to do this thing that we are not conditioned to. Right. And she was like, well, you should just get in therapy so you can get it on our level. And he was like, even that yeah. is hard to wrap yeah. our yeah. head around. That's can you a very like ex- harsh, yeah. yeah, it's a harsh framework. And so going back to what the research shows about genders and that women typically fall under that, anxious bucket, whereas men fall under the avoidant dismissive bucket. So already you got to start with, we're in different places yeah, and that's okay. We just got to normalize that we're coming at this thing from different places. Right. But I think that women do, and I think me and you talked about this maybe on our last podcast is don't back down from being the role model Mm -hmm. when it comes to identifying your emotions and how you're sitting with them. It could be something that came up with work. Somebody cut you off in traffic. Like when you're having that come home, talk to each other, you know, lay in bed moments, share how you process, you're processing certain emotions. I promise you that that has an effect. It may be like a little slow drip, but But ultimately, you know, he'll talk about that boss at work that rubbed (laughs) him the wrong way. Right. Or, you know, that friend that's tripping and how that's making them feel. So, being that, but also the thing that women can do with their with their partners too is start more acutely. So asking them like, think about the mental health piece of mm-hmm. it, right? So asking them like, you know, you've been complaining about having these headaches a lot, mm-hmm. or there's some type of chronic pain thing that may just like this crick in my neck. Mm-hmm. Like just start identifying how those certain physical ailments mm. of your body are making you feel, right? Mm-hmm. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to build almost like a foreign language. Yeah, for it's sure. It's like we, I don't know this stuff, yeah. right? I'm still with a whole PhD in psychology learning the language of this stuff, right? So I think the more we can normalize those conversations, the more men feel like, oh, we just have an everyday, everyday rap. We're just talking about what our day was like. Right. So it's just those small baby steps. I'm loving this, uh, what I call a spicy tip right here, yeah. because um, part of what I get are uh, women who are coming to me and they uh, are extremely strong, uh, like the alpha queen mm-hmm. and uh, having a hard time sitting in their femininity because they've experienced uh, so much pain with men, rejection maybe. Mm-hmm. And so 
in order to, I feel like, survive in a male world where you want to make this relationship work or in partnership, we desensitize ourselves and we sit more in our masculine energy and they still want the masculine man who knows how to also pivot into love. Yeah. So therefore I have to get them into their softness right. in order to guide their partner there. And so I love that you're hitting on this because that is like money right there mm -hmm. is that if we want men to get there, we are going to have to be a part of this process in the vessel. Absolutely. And in us enhancing our awareness, our emotional vocabulary, then practicing they will then mirror our behavior. Yeah. Well, I think so. I'm glad we're having this, this conversation about secure attachments is because I think one of the tips I would give women if they feel like I'm anxious dating someone who's avoidant, mm -hmm. which is very much the norm, is focus more on your pivot into secure attachment. Because the more you move into secure attachment versus that anxious, that's where you start to see the very thing you just said. The grace is just going to naturally come. Yes. It naturally comes with secure because I'm telling you, the fellas will feel the difference between she's she's doing this because she thinks that I'm not interested or that mm -hmm. she's going to lose me or that she needs to do this to like cling to me. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between that versus like, okay, babe, this is this is going on. Mm -hmm. Like, like, can we talk about it? Yeah. Like, there's a difference in emotions that come with how you're imploring someone to go about the work. Yeah. And if and if a guy feels like, hmm, this feels very much like gimme, gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. If you don't do this ultimatum, yep. nobody wants to lean into that. Yeah. Yeah. So you've you've got to make that transition into okay. Smooth. I'm I'm I've healed my anxious wounds. Now I'm moving into secure attachment, and the more you operate in that secure attachment, that grace is going to come and come along with it. Do you feel like you see the shift in men after that has happened? If a woman oh, is focusing on her security? oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, you see it. Like it it becomes that mirror. Like I'm telling you. So for folks who are wondering, well, I am anxious. I know it. I've done the quiz, mm -hmm. or I'm avoiding. I've done the quiz. Can I get, can I move to secure? Yeah. You absolutely can. Does it happen overnight? No. There are steps to this. Yes. Right? And you you will still find yourself from time, I would say particularly in the beginning of a relationship where maybe you're dating someone who's already secure mm -hmm. or you're moving into secure, you're still going to have trigger moments. Yeah. Like, like I was saying earlier, people who are predominantly securely attached, they still might have a little bit of fearful that mm -hmm. pops up, a little bit of anxiousness that pops up for them from time to time. So that's where you might get triggered from something from childhood, something from a past relationship. But you don't respond the same way that you would have a year or two ago. And yeah. that's where the real magic starts Ooh, that's to when the peace comes. <laughs> yes, when you stop responding the way or, you know, responding with anger or feeling that need to write that long text message, all of that Ooh. stuff really starts you know to go edits out. I've the... had to do like, we're not going to send this. Yeah. We're going to send this because <laughs> yeah. they want to send that long message. Absolutely. Can you speak a little for those who are like unfamiliar with the attachment styles? Can you yeah. speak a little to why avoiding and anxious are magnets for each other? Um, and then how they can coexist. Sure. So, you know, we, we all are trying to either avoid the uncomfort, you know, uncomfortable feelings, the, you know, discomfort, pain of what we dealt with in the past. Like we all wait, we, we are. And so sometimes the anxious person will come into the avoidant or dismissive person's life and in their attempt to like not rock the boat, they're showing an example of what mm -hmm. I want. But sooner or later, the true authentic mm -hmm. version of you with all of your wounds and all of your pain is going to come to the surface again and they're going to start to see it. And I think the same thing, like it, it goes in, in the reverse way. It's just like, OK, he's much more chill. He's not as uptight and, you know, barking at me. Yeah. And I love that. That's attractive to me. But then you feel like, well, does he care? Like, <laughs> I don't. Because now it's feeling like he doesn't even care. Right. So, yeah, those things naturally in the beginning do have a way of attracting each other because it it almost feels like, oh, it's not what I had before. Or it could be the it could be yeah. the flip. It could be this is what mm, I'm used this, to. this feels really familiar. Mm. But if it's all, you know, 
that could feel comfortable too. It, it it's really complicated because yeah. it's like it could be one or the other. It could be okay. They're showing me a little something different than what I know, or they're showing me something that is. And mm-hmm. both of that, both of those things can be attractive, right? Yeah, for both sure. Both of those, depending on you're how like, you're. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in doing that dance and trying to figure out like, okay, what is this that's going on? How do we make the relationship work if our partner isn't doing the self-work and we are telling ourselves we don't got time to do the self-work? Can an avoidant and an anxious like still have magic in the relationship? You can. I mean, you could still have great physical connection. I think most of us have probably <laughs> experienced that on some level, which can make you stay longer, yeah. right? Particularly if that's your primary, if physical touch is your primary love language mm-hmm. and your needs are getting met in that way. I think that's what happens a lot of times. I think a lot of situationships are a mm. lot of times two people who are avoided. I think a lot of times it's two people who are avoided. As crazy as that sounds, yeah. because like... Ultimately, there's this fear of "Mm, if I go too far in this now, I've given too much control. Uh I've given you have you have the power to pull some strings and do some things to create some emotional turmoil in me. Uh, But that's just I'm I'm going off on a tangent on that. But I do think that two people who are anxious and avoided can work. But you're going to have there are going to be bumps in the road. There are going to be moments where. One of the partners shuts down yeah. and you're pulling at them. Are there going to be times where maybe you're getting on the other partner's nerve yeah. because they feel like you just keep pulling and you just keep pushing them to do this work? Yeah. But to answer your question, I would say I think that everybody has to kind of have this um, window that they give relationships, right? Like if you're doing the work and yeah you're giving them grace to mm-hmm. do that and you're just not seeing any effort yeah you have to decide okay i've given this x amount of time yeah. whatever your window is because you could be missing out on your person who is more securely attached yeah so it's and it's it's hard it's i think when love one. is involved right it like is. you can know you are in a situation that maybe even volatile and you're like i shouldn't be here but i have these feelings for this person right and so i think it's easier to get out when you are dating yeah. versus when you realize like you walk down the aisle with someone and signed on the dotted line. Right. And uh, I have a, a couple right now who uh, she's avoidant and he's anxious mm-hmm. and uh, I won't let them divorce. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's not what we're going to do. What we're going right. to do is we're going to work through this and we're going to start with our language to each other. We're going to yeah. start with our interpretation. Of course we are doing like the internal work to heal essentially what comes from their mm-hmm. childhood. Mm-hmm. But it's the, okay, even when y'all don't have faith in each other, at least me as a third party has faith in mm-hmm. you guys. And I think that we're always pushing this whole, like, get help, get help. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you don't have the capacity to do it on your mm-hmm. own. But we create this cycle of um, resentment towards each other for the things that, like, are being done or unsaid. And you have now this person who, even in conflict, is avoiding and this other person who's charging in. Yeah. <laughs> So it shows up in like the conflict resolve as well. Absolutely. And so I think that when you don't have those tools and when you're not able to execute uh, or have someone help like facilitate, you're not even one aware that this problem is going on, but you don't have anything in your toolbox to use in those moments of crises. Right. right. And I know I'm, I'm a product of my mom was anxious and my dad was, was avoiding. Like I know they've never taken the quiz, but me knowing what I know, Absolutely. Which is why, again, before I became secure, those were my two yeah. predominant buckets. It makes perfect sense. That's so funny. My yeah. brother, uh, I just had a conversation with him yesterday, and he said the same thing about our parents. He yeah. was like, mom was anxious and yeah. he romanticized love. Right. Our dad was like a player from the Himalaya yeah. and didn't want to like right. be emotionally available. But you know, another thing I want to point out, I was thinking about this, is that like, so folks who are secure, it doesn't necessarily mean that they had a cookie cutter upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, a person who's secure could have grown up in an environment where let's say their, their mom was very much emotionally available mm-hmm. and, and showed up for him or her, but then maybe they had a dad or a step parent mm-hmm. who was avoidant or just, you know, fearful and didn't show up in a very loving way. That child could still grow up to be secure attached. 
and what that father or mm. parent didn't give them, maybe they got from a grandmother. Mm. Maybe they got from their auntie and their uncle, that community, that village that we talk about. Yeah. So there are certain nuances when it comes to how you develop as a secure attachment. So I did want to make sure. So in uh, them receiving love, like elsewhere, you're yeah. saying to fulfill uh, maybe that other role that like should have been <laughs> like yeah. that other person that should have shown up for them. Right. Um, somebody else gave it to them. Yeah. 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 Then though, in that process is the person able to, uh, recognize and attach and desire and attached, or are they, there's a potential to make decisions like their parent and choose the avoidant. Mm, I think it could go either way, probably. Because I feel like I see both. Yeah. I see some yeah, who are like, who yeah, I want yeah, to yeah. care. And then others who are like, yeah. I don't know why I keep choosing this type of dude. And I'm like, because your stepdaddy right. was that and your mama Absolutely. made choices like that. Absolutely. So it's just that pattern. that Because again, what we were talking about earlier is like, it could probably be comfortable for me in a way if I was still operating in ancient avoidant mm -hmm. to date someone who was avoidant. Yeah. Because my dad was. Like, and I know that dynamic. It's like, I know that at some point he's going to come out of it and be fun and yeah. maybe want to go to the park. And then most days he's not. He's just going to want to be on the couch and not talk and do anything. Yeah. I know that world. So that can be comfortable. Right. But it doesn't mean that it's the healthiest. It doesn't mean that I'm my happiest because I decided to just go with what, what I know. Can you speak to, cause this is your expertise as far as like, um, uh, media and yeah. entertainment is yeah, concerned. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, we're seeing so much of this like uh, gender war and toxic culture that's going on in dating and relationship, mm -hmm. almost as if like men and women are against each other in um, who's worse, right? <laughs> it's yeah. like, you guys are worse. No, you guys are worse. Right. And uh, with this story that, you know, it, it is going out there as far as like it being so hard to date, they... We're perpetuating one, I think, like in these examples, but I want you to speak to um, the culture of dating because it does feel like, based on what social media is telling us, that men aren't settling down. Men aren't committing at the rate that they used to. I mean, statistically, uh, our generation is just slower to marry than previous generations. Right. right. But as far as the men, it does feel like there's not the same level of pride mm -hmm. in partnership that there used to be. Yeah. So, is, so there is research that's showing that, well, we've known this for a while, but now I think there's really relevant up-to-date research to show it is that our parents and grandparents, they got married for a completely different reason mm -hmm. than the, the reason we are moving into getting married, yeah. right? They got married for survival. Yeah. Like li there were like women couldn't get certain jobs yeah. and couldn't have certain, you know, insurance and things unless they were married, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is a completely different world from what we know. And what the research is showing now is that when people decide to get married now, it's because they truly want partnership. Mm. They truly want somebody who they can emotionally connect with yeah. and we can build together and do some things. It's not just about like, the convenience <laughs> right, of marriage. Yeah. And so I don't, I can't speak for all men, but I would think that if you were going to move into marriage and let's say you have the awareness that, okay, I have the option between marrying someone who's anxiously attached when mm -hmm. I'm secure or finding my other secure partner, yeah. I'm going to hold out to find my other secure partner. Now, again, are the masses of men, do they, have they done the attachment style quiz and right. do they know it? I don't know, but I would hope that if we are really buckling down and saying, I want like partnership, mm -hmm. true, emotional, deep bond with somebody who sees me and I see them, then you're going to be a little bit more selective, I would hope. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be a little bit more. But you're saying this is attributed to their secureness, not to their avoidance? Well, no, I'm just generally speaking in oh, terms of like us what holding the, out. Oh, you're saying us as a as a as a, gen, as a population are holding out more yeah, as we do the work. We want to be more secure. Okay. Yeah, just versus just getting married because like get I'm married. 25 now. Got you. Okay, agree. I should be married and have a family yeah. and kids with the dog and the picket fence. I think that there should be a move away from that actually yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's like well, what are we building right. on if that's if that's our motive? It's like. All right, well, I could do that with anybody. So you're you're just saying that uh, 
<laughs> being smarter in our decisions to couple and to partner. Yeah. That we're not being like we're not jumping in with the same reasons. Right. I think that's one layer of okay. it. But I think there's also, and this is across genders, I think that there's a an awakening happening mm-hmm. of like, I'm just not gonna put up with crap. Like mm-hmm. I'm not gonna put up with BS. I'm not gonna let you walk all over yeah. me. I'm not gonna let you talk to me any kind of way. I'm not gonna deal with dysfunction yeah. day after day, especially if you saw that model. Yeah. Because now we have this awareness that, oh, I don't have to do life this way. Yeah. Right? So I think that there's this awareness of like what healthy re- relationships can look like. And it's like, if if it's not that, I yeah. don't want it. I'm I'm hoping that that's the movement that's uh, happening. Yes. <laughs> and I feel like we're contributing to that, especially with not just these conversations, but just like um, people uh, starting to now feel comfortable with getting help and like doing the internal work, right? Um, but my original question that I'm gonna circle back to yeah. was, why does it feel like there's more avoidant men on the market than previously? Mm, yeah, I mean, if we go with psychology, let's it's, go with psychology. It's, it's it's where the caregiver part came in. You know, it's it's how. You were loved, not loved. Uh, it was how available your mom and dad were or weren't. Um, and I I hope, as I listen to different podcasts and I have conversations with friends who maybe they grew up in a two-parent household versus their mom raised them, their dad raised them, there does seem to be this collective reckoning happening mm-hmm. of like, oh, I'm going to do it different, mm. right? And so the avoiding marriage for some men can't say all of them for some men isn't so much like oh I keep meeting all these anxious people and like boo Mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna do that it's just like no like I need I need to really like do the work like I really need to move more into vulnerability authenticity in order to be able to really show up for my partner Mm. I'm seeing more of an awareness now. Also, as a psychologist, I do recognize I have a very unique <laughs> group of men that I frequent, you know, and talk to and have conversations with. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's this one size fits all. Like, oh, this is the reason why all men are avoiding. I think it's buckets. Okay, I think there's because I do think buckets. that there is a population of uh, men who are struggling with. Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah. And yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah. I don't want the responsibility of right. partnership. Yeah. I don't want to have to grow up essentially. Yeah. Um, and it is a big ask, right? Yeah. For you, when you're in partnership, yes, you are responsible for self, but you are also saying, I'm also going to be conscious of the way that I make you feel. Right. Absolutely. And you mentioned ghosting earlier. I think that the avoidant is responsible for <laughs> ghosting coming about. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely. is this, I don't want to have to share with you why I don't want you. Exactly. And I don't like the way that you reacting makes me feel about right. releasing you. Exactly. So therefore I'm not going to address maybe the conflict or the problem of why I don't see this going anywhere. Absolutely. There's that, which is very real, very relevant. And then also everything can't, while we all have an attachment style, not everything can sort of be chalked up to that. Like, Personality disorders are a very real thing, mm-hmm. right? Again, get into therapy yeah. and, and figure out, okay, maybe, all right, maybe I'm avoidant, sure, but are there any other mental mm. challenges or personality disorders that are at work here that yeah. are preventing me from having healthy relationships? So I would encourage people to do that. The other thing I was going to say that I think sort of ties all of this together in terms of this awakening that's happening is we're discovering that it's okay, it's healthy, it's a great thing to not necessarily look for your partner to meet all of your emotional needs. Yes, I'm here for that. Like That is a part of the awakening. I call it the relationship revolution. Absolutely. But I like if you're an, like if you're thought. anxious, right? And you are dealing, you are dating somebody who's avoidant, right? Like instead of living in misery, right, <laughs> day after day, because like, why won't she or he Do show this. up for me yes. in this way? Like, what's your tribe look like? What's your community, your friends, your homeboys, your homegirls? Where, like, who who's the one homegirl that's like, 
she's there for you yeah. when you're having that that rough patch at work. That your boyfriend or your husband, they just they don't really have the tools for that. They, yeah. You can go lay on his lap. And he he will let you lay there all night. Yeah. But he doesn't really have the language to comfort you. Let your homegirl comfort you that way. You know what I'm saying? And that, we have to normalize that too. And I think that that's been shunned upon because we, there's some fear there about like just um, emotional infidelity, mm. right? That like, mm-hmm. oh, if I start telling this person there, there's a fine line you have to walk, right? But I think the the burden, the weight of wanting our partner to give us all oh. and meet all of our emotional needs, that's unrealistic. I mean, that's just too much for them to care. It is. Uh, regardless of our attachment style, I am f- fully in agreement with you yeah. that there needs to be a, a village behind you that is providing and meeting other needs. It cannot be entirely on one person but I think in the story being sold to us that it's supposed to be our prince and princess and uh best friends and if we're best friends that means that you have to depend on me for everything yeah. and I have to depend on you for yeah. everything no even yeah. when you have best friends you still got other friends right so like you need to turn to your other resources mm-hmm. and like community for certain things because right. they can't be all things right. all at once and you'll find that manifest um, organically when you move into secure attachment style too. A securely attached partner's gonna say, Spice Mara, please go hang out with the girls tonight. <laughs> like, go have a girls night. I'm gonna be right here when you get back. Yeah. I'll hold the kids down. I'm not tripping. Like, they won't be texting you the whole night. Like, that's why secure attachment is the goal because you really will thrive in a way that you haven't been able to when you've just been heavy in the throes of anxious and avoiding. So you agree it should be the goal. It should be the goal for us. If we are avoided or anxious or disorganized, uh, the goal should be how do we get to security? Absolutely. It should be. And again, remember, though, that secure doesn't mean perfect. Because that there's this myth that, okay, once I'm no longer insecure... <laughs> Life is no, like we, we all are constantly evolving in terms of our emotional regulation yeah. and our emotional intelligence. So you're still going to have hiccups here and there because yeah. you're two imperfect people trying to build something together. Yeah. So just knowing that secure attachment doesn't mean perfect is key. What celebrities, if you can list any, do you see relationship wise? You're like, mm, that's an anxious or that's an avoidant or that's a secure. Is there any mm. couples or celebrities out there that you maybe admire what they show so again all this is hypothetical yeah hypothetical. I don't we know don't these know people them. i'm not <laughs> in their house with them but i could see where we'll use jay-z and beyonce for okay. her. and i I'll, I'll pick on jay-z because we have the same birthday december 4th um hey. i could see based on lemonade and what we know about how Lemonade came to Gave be. Gave us a lot of insight, yes. Right. That 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 could be a situation where, it, at least at one point, mm-hmm. maybe was anxious and avoidant. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, one part, partner was, was more anxious and the other partner was avoidant. And maybe through the healing mm-hmm. post-Lemonade, maybe they both have moved in secure, into mm-hmm. secure attachment now. That's just... Based on what they've given us, too. Yeah, based, you know, we listen to the lyrics. <laughs> based on the songs. And yeah, and the songs. <laughs> based as, on the as our only little lens. <laughs> I could see where that was once upon a time there. Um, what's another one? Um, that's kind of in our face. Michelle and Barack. Oh, I, I could I see them. where... Barack has probably always been secure. Mm. I kind of get that vibe from him. And I could see where maybe Michelle was either avoidant or anxious and has now moved to secure. Mm. Like they give me the perception I have of them is of of both of them being secure now. So I'm part of the tribe that worships Michelle. I think she's yeah. like the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think or what, uh, like what, signs what a, of the, yeah, for the anxious and avoidant? So for Barack, from what I know from his childhood, um, I think he was raised by his mom, but he gives me that sense of like he had the village. Yeah. Like he had that that secure village around him and that is what it manifested as. Um, with Michelle, I'm more leaning into the whole gender myth of like women being a little bit more anxious mm-hmm. and... I don't know. It's a vibe thing. Okay. It's just a vibe I'm thing. Not, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah, I can yeah, yeah, see yeah. as a... Uh, so here's my theory, okay? Yeah. Um, that 
in his pursuit of Michelle or their connection mm -hmm. as they're dating, right. being in partnership with Michelle, I think helped Brock become more secure yeah, absolutely. because you have a woman behind you who believes in you. She's yep. a, an authority figure yep. for you in yep. like the career place because right. she was further advanced. But I think, um, was able to help facilitate and foster his security. For sure. Then as he starts to climb in his mm -hmm. uh, career path mm -hmm. and in his process and really becoming the man who he is, I can see her becoming a little bit more anxious yeah. and like, oh my goodness, am I really about to right. be like dating right. <laughs> this political leader? Yeah. Then him becoming president. Right. And then... You said avoidant. I feel like she started off probably a little avoidant. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can see that. Because she, you know, she has like this this uh, stern, strong demeanor. Absolutely. But then in uh, Barack's ability to communicate and reassure, which I think is what we love about him, right. is he's always affirming, affirming, right. affirming. I am this, and I have done this because of my partnership. Right. Right. It probably contributed to her security. Right. This is my storyline that I'm Listen. with you creating. Yeah. <laughs> and I we're think in too, this story together. <laughs> what what made me not check Michelle off into the secure right away was I liken what I know about her childhood upbringing to my mom's mm. in that that particular generation they grew up with the dad who was just like the hard worker yeah 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 but wasn't always emotionally available yep. right so that can then manifest in you being you know void and anxious depending on the way you look at it and so but yeah those are the only two couples that are kind of Come no, I love this because right I feel like it gives us a uh, like a little window into um, one, like not just how we show up, but like people who we admire or things that people experience. They're real humans. Yeah. Uh, they've experienced uh, a plethora of different stages. Yeah. And when we know that you can go through certain stages or certain seasons of your life where you're anxious or avoidant and you can get to a place of security. Right. I also think who you choose is extremely important in that growth process. Yeah. So you can work as hard as you want to to become a secure person. But if you stay with someone who is not helping facilitate that, I do believe like you can do the work, do the work, and you're in love with someone who's not willing to do the work. Yeah. And you, through your awakening, decide we shouldn't be together because no matter how far I climb up, right. you won't come with right. me. Because a secure attachment, again, going back to our original point, like – a secure attached person will be attracted to you. Yeah. Like you could be anxious and avoid and they're attracted to you. But if you just continue to show the same unhealthy patterns with them over and over again, based on your own wound, sooner or later, they're going to say, all right, yeah. this, enough is enough, you know, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to cave, cave on their, sec their secure attachment. Yeah. They're just going to be like, all right, let me move myself to something that's more healthy. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Okay. I love this discussion. Yeah. Uh, I know you uh, have services that you offer and things yeah. that you like share with our community. Like, please let everybody know, like, where they can find you, how they can get more information, um, resources, yeah. uh, anything that you offer that you want sure. to like let people know about. Yeah. So, you know, my training, as as many of you know, who may follow me on social media, if you don't, please follow me at Corey Emanuel on Instagram and Twitter, Dr. Corey Emanuel on TikTok. Uh, but I do a lot of consulting work. Um, so happy to come in, do workshops. Um, I do Zoom trainings all the time. We can do the media side of psychology. We can do the mental health side of things. Uh, but I think I shared with you earlier, 2024, I'm looking into offering some mental health coaching mm. packages, which I haven't done. Uh, but now it's, it's time. I, I, it's absolutely time. And to I do forgot that. to bring this back up, but you mentioned to me earlier, you're in a relationship now. So we are no longer with the, uh, no, we're out of the, the six and a half year we are now unhealthy. In, we're in a secure and he's secured too. He's yep, secure. Part, yep. I'm like, I'm not gonna put your business out no, there. No, no, you're fine. Yeah, no, we both. So I wasn't, again, I, I didn't start out secure. Okay. I started out in, I think I was predominantly avoidant. And then the other piece was like, anxious and so secure was way down on the on the totem pole uh but yeah my partner secure started out the gate we had hiccups in the beginning because i my stuff from the six and a half yeah. year was still coming up it, without it wasn't even that it was the real true experience yeah it could it could be like well normally we text twice by now and like i haven't heard from you all day so what does that mean yeah right and so then you go into that 
that spiral and it created conflict mm. in the beginning. But again, the beautiful part of dating someone who's secure yeah. is they'll ro- they they're gonna call you on your shit. <laughs> they're gonna be like, Whoa, like no, like that ain't got nothing to yes. do with me. And you're gonna have to sit in the truth of that to be like, Yeah, you were just literally working. Yes. <laughs> you were like you weren't on some shady trying to avoid mm-hmm. ghost type stuff. And so yeah, like but but dating someone secure absolutely will raise yeah, for sure. your potential to be able to be like, oh, I can do this yep. work. Like yep. this work isn't as foreign as I thought it was. It's gonna be uncomfortable at first, but the more you 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 ride that way, yeah, it's like, oh, I can do this. This this is my preferred way to actually do relationships. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. feels good. While it is more work, it Abs- feels so much better. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm so happy for you. Thank you you deserve this. You guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my IG at spicy Mari. Go to the spicylife.com, click and subscribe, share this episode with a friend. If you want to find Dr. Corey Emanuel, I'm telling you his social media is the bomb. It uh, pick it's my little pick me up for the day uh, when I see his <laughs> page come across my timeline but uh appreciate you guys joining us on this episode like i said share it with a friend and there you guys have it you have just been spiced the spicy life